Okay, soft training is when the training is more or less a test standard and um, you can be far more Socratic or facilitative in your training. Well, that is, to be Socratic means uh, comes from the Greek philosopher, philosopher Socrates, where um, he would encourage people to think for themselves. And for example, Socratic trainings, when you give them a hint, for example, you know, how long is that green traffic light being green for? Um, to see if they realize the traffic light may change. So you're encouraging them to think for themselves. You're being Socratic. And facilitative training is when you just more or less let them drive. You give them very minimum, minimum help. And normally you would pull them up and talk about the drive after they finish driving. So you, you can um, replay the drive to them. And in your head, you call out you know, the whole drive, call out the mistakes, and you discuss it at the end. The problem with some instructors is they're didactic all the way through. So they never really encourage what we call the transference of responsibility. So a trainee, um, in the beginning, they're struggling, they're making mistakes, and the instructor's been quite didactic, sometimes over-instructing, um, because there is something called over-instructing and under-instructing. Over-instructing is when you're saying so much that the trainee can never really grasp what you're saying, what you want them to do, and they're just confused, and they're overwhelmed. And sometimes that happens when instructors get tired. <clears throat> under-instructing is when you become disinterested, and maybe the trainee's making so many mistakes, you just sit back and don't really say anything. Um, that's not the same as being facilitative, by the way. Facilitative is when they can drive and you give them the space and you give them the freedom to drive without interrupting too much. But um, when they're struggling, you just sit back and say nothing and watch them make more and more mistakes. That's quite cruel um, and you don't want to under-instruct. So going back to the hard and soft training, some instructors are didactic all the way through and the trainees never really get to take full responsibility of driving the bus because the instructor is always telling them what to do. Where you've got a certain point where you have to take a step back and just give them hints or then just let them drive when they're near a test standard. The yardstick that we use to make sure that somebody's ready for test is generally we expect them to be able to drive for two or three days without too much help. I mean, you might have to give them the odd hint or the odd little bit of help here if things get really difficult but they should generally be able to drive pretty much by themselves for two or three days. And then we know, then we know they're pretty much ready for test. Um, so, yep, didactic, Socratic, and facilitative training. Hard and soft training. Hard training is more military-like, where you <clears throat> have to give them lots of help and encouragement. And soft training is when you step back and let them drive. And that encourages, as I said, the transference of responsibility. Um... I would say that, in my experience, the majority of instructors over-instruct and some get it just about right. It's never perfect, it's not an exact, exact science. It's so difficult, especially when you've got three or four trainees on the bus, all at different standards, when you've dealt with somebody who's really struggling, who's new, or maybe they're halfway through the course and they're really struggling, and then they finish driving, and then you get somebody else to step in who's almost a test standard. <clears throat> and because for the last half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever, You've been having to speak a lot. It's very difficult then just to shut up and let the guy who's a test standard drive. You end up chipping in and saying things as they're driving where you should just take a step back. So you've got to understand that the instructors are under a lot of stress there when you've got three or four trainees at different levels of driving. Um, so that's part of the psychology to it. Um, um, as I said, in terms of managing the bus, you need to know about um, the technical, technical aspects of the bus. Obviously, you need to know the routes that you're going to use. It's very important to do circuit work where you pick a circuit, a tight route or tight circuit, and you need to go around and round and round again. <clears throat> the circuit should ideally be about 15 to 20 minutes long so that each trainee can do it three or four times. So as they go around, they get better and better, and they can see their improvements. Um, I used the U3 route in Uxbridge and West Drayton and um, the parts of the 371 route in Richmond and Ham really really tight and um, if you want to message me or ask me where those routes go I'll tell you and they're just absolutely brilliant for training um, so obviously um, be aware of bridges be aware of weight restrictions with restrictions things like that um, <clears throat> there are a couple of places where I can take the trainees um, where once they're a test standard I'll take them on roads which are clearly signposted where there is restriction um, I'm not trying to catch them out, I'm trying to see if they're reading the road signs. So um, there are a couple of places where I'll take them and I'll see if, as they're driving along, they see the clear signs tell them that they cannot proceed ahead, then they need to divert either left or right. 
and I want to see if they see those signs and take the appropriate diversion. If they don't, obviously I've got to stop them and then point out the sign and make sure they turn left or right before it's too late because we don't want to end up reversing the bus. So, um, yep, the route, the vehicle, technical aspects. Um, you need to know about other things like, for example, if you break down what the procedures are there. Um, during COVID, if we'd broken down, um, the recovery truck drivers weren't prepared to take anybody in the truck with them. So if we'd broken down in Watford or St. Norm um, not St. Norbert's, um, Potters Bar or, or somewhere like Enfield, and we've got to wait for the recovery truck, you might be waiting six or seven hours in the cold. Um, when the recovery, recovery truck gets there, um, by that time, the trainees have probably gone home under their own steam by the instructor because he's been waiting for the bus. He can't get a lift back with a recovery truck driver because um, they wouldn't take anybody in the truck with him. They couldn't because of COVID restrictions. So you don't have to find a way of making your way back home yourself. Um, obviously, at that point, if you've parked your car in the garage, by the time you get back to the garage, if it's nighttime, all the buses have come back and your car's blocked in. So you need to be thinking about all these things before they happen. You've really got to be planning your day well ahead. Um, aside from that, you need to know procedures like, you know, um, what happens if a trainee goes sick while training, um, what you do, um, what happens if you get a breakdown um, in a, in a, you know, you're on a fast road or whatever, you know, how to secure the vehicle properly, follow those, all, all those processes. And then it comes to the license requirements. When you check the trainee's licenses, you need to know what to look out for, um, how to check the license, how to fill out the training record correctly. And um, yeah, <clears throat> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of paperwork and, and admin to be done as well. But the majority of it is keeping the bus safe, keeping the trainees safe and making sure that they're improving every day. Um, you need to be comfortable using a whiteboard on the bus because people learn best visually by watching things. So you need to get comfortable standing in the front of the bus with a whiteboard, drawing things out and doing your lesson plans. Uh, the main ones really are uh, moving away and stopping roundabouts, left and right turns and overtaking dual carriageways. It's important to understand that you only control the vehicle in two dimensions, left or right, faster or slower. It's not like flying a helicopter or a plane where you've got to, you know, <clears throat> control the, the aircraft in four or five different dimensions at the same time. Um, pilots learn about something called cross-coupling, which is when you do one thing with controls and it affects something else. So, for example, uh, a good example of cross-coupling when you're driving is every time you um, check your mirror, you tuck the steering wheel by mistake. You don't want to do it, but it just happens. That's cross-coupling. Um, sometimes you'll find with trainees, especially when they're steering around very tight corners, as they're pushing and pulling on the steering, their foot is getting very heavy with the brake and they're pumping the brake pedal because as the muscles in their arms are working, it's also triggering um, the muscles in their leg to start pumping the brake pedal and you've got to knock that out of them, so no cross-coupling. Um, this is just, I mean, something you need to do for the trainees as well as demystify the whole thing about driving because sometimes people come into the industry and they're just overwhelmed by the size of the vehicle and the way it behaves. behaves they don't understand that it's floating on air suspension as you're driving down the road the air suspension will bounce and the majority of the time you just hold the wheel straight and if you feel feel the vehicle start to move then you make a smooth correction you don't want to be overcorrecting all the time you're constantly trying to correct the bounce of the air suspension my god that will just make you so tired but some instructors don't know this and they don't teach it um, <clears throat> Position is always more important than speed as well. A lot of people emphasize position, but they uh, emphasize speed, sorry, but they won't emphasize position. And position is always more important than speed. Um, with the police driving course, they use a procedure called IPSCA. Um, we use MSPSL, which is mirror, signal, position, speed, look. And the police use a system called IPSCA, which means information, which is scanning the road, position, speed, Gear acceleration. So whereas we make position the third thing on the list, the police make it the second thing on the list. It's information, position, speed, gear acceleration. Whereas we say mirror, signal, position, speed, look. Um, and remember when we just spoke about scanning, I told you about um, the police use information, which is scanning. You're not just scanning. A lot of instructors forget to tell the trainees that you're zooming as well. So you're going from the near field to the far field to the midfield from the far field to the midfield to the near field. Your eyes aren't just scanning from left and right, they're zooming as well. And although the scanning can happen quite quickly, if you look at an object that's very far away from you and then zoom back or vice versa, that zooming can actually take it half a second because if your eyes aren't used to doing it, if you've been driving cars and you're not been looking that far, 
you've really got to stretch your eyes further down the road and your eyes are not used to doing it. So the zooming aspect is sometimes harder than the scanning aspect. <clears throat> we divide the roads, or I divide the roads, into different zones. So you've got basically your near field, which is from where the vehicle is maybe to 100 metres down the road. So if you're driving down a busy high street with people walking around, that's what you need to be aware of. Car doors opening, children running out, cycles putting out in front of you, whatever. <clears throat> then you've got the midfield, which is further. So at speeds of around 30 miles an hour, you're looking from 100 metres to say 300 metres, 400 metres down the road. You're dealing with things like traffic lights changing, maybe um, cars pulling out in front of you, whatever. And then you've got the far field. So you're looking at sort of 40 miles and then beyond. You're looking much, much further at motorway speeds. <clears throat> you're looking for things that are happening, you know, maybe more than 300 metres, 400 metres down the road, because if you're driving at 60 miles an hour on the motorway and, you know, you need to stop, you're going to need a lot of space to stop smoothly. So you've got the near field, the midfield and the far field, but then also you've got left and right. So, for example, you've got the near field left and right. <clears throat> so when you're driving, generally speaking, at slower speeds, the near field left is going to be the bigger problem because that's where people can open the car doors, people can step out from. As your speed increases, you kind of have to look into the midfield both sides. And this is where some drivers suffer a little bit. Their midfield right, so looking at things on the opposite side of the road where oncoming vehicles are coming from, where oncoming cars are parked, that's a bit weak. So they don't realise that if somebody opens a car door on the opposite side of the road, <clears throat> it's going to make the oncoming vehicle coming towards them swerve into their side of the road. And then, of course, you've got the far field. And generally speaking, it's easier to monitor both sides of the road on the far field because of the vanishing points of the road. When you look at things much further away, the road seems to get narrow. So it's easier to track both sides of the road <clears throat> in the far field. But you do tend to find that some people suffer with the midfield right. That's where their observation isn't as good as it should be. Um, and you can see that when you're watching them drive. And as well as that, you've got obviously the two zones next to the bus, the left and right, directly next to the bus, which you see in your mirrors. And of course, the zone behind you as well. So you could say that there are six zones in front of you, two on either side and one directly behind you. So there's nine zones around the vehicle that you need to be aware of. And of course, any good driver would always be thinking about the height of the vehicle as well. So you've got the zone above you <laughs> where the trees and the bridges are. And I always make my trainees call out every bridge before they go and do it. If there's no sign, it's at least 16 feet six. So if there is a sign, they need to tell me how high that bridge is before they go under it, because otherwise I know they're not looking at the height of the bridge and they're missing the most important sign that you'll ever see on the road. So, uh, yeah, you've got the uh, psychology um, and that as well. And you've got to be comfortable standing at the front of the vehicle whiteboard and telling the trainees everything that I've just taught you. Um, you've got to manage the time on the bus and you've got to manage the trainees as well. You don't want them sitting there on their mobile phones or listening to music, they need to be actively doing something um, positive. So either reading the highway code, revising for their theory tests or module four, um, or just sitting there watching you. I mean, people will get bored, they will zen out a little bit and you've got to give them a little bit of leeway. But generally speaking, they need to be using their time constructively and they need to have the right attitude. It's very rare that you get a trainee with a bad attitude because that's only picked up quite early in the interview or in the classroom, but it does happen where you get the odd one that creeps through that they have a, do have a bit of an attitude on them and uh, the worst one we ever had in my memory was actually a car driving instructor because he thought he knew everything just be aware also that some instructors are a little bit over and zealous over zealous with this they get a trainee who's trying to put across their side of events their, 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 their um, interpretation of what's happened and the instructor thinks they're trying to tell the instructor their job or tell the instructor what to do. No. You've got to be intelligent enough to realise that everybody has the right to um, justify or explain what they're doing. And you've got to be prepared to listen to them. If you were flying an aircraft and you were a first officer and for some reason the captain makes a decision where you don't feel it's safe and it's not just putting the aircraft in danger, it's putting your life in danger as well, you're allowed to say three times I do not agree with your decision. After the third time that you've said that, the captain legally has to um, make the aircraft safe, go back up and discuss with you why you think what he's doing isn't safe. Because it has happened in the past with some airlines um, in other countries where the first officers uh, are treated 
a little bit worse and the captains are treated like gods where aircraft have crushed because the first officer hasn't had the confidence to challenge the decisions of the captain. There's a very famous one actually on mental pilot that's just been released now where um, a Russian captain <clears throat> is behaving appallingly and the first officer just doesn't have the, the courage or the confidence to, to challenge the captain's decision and the aircraft ends up crashing and everybody gets killed. So if you've got a trainee that's trying to tell you something and um, especially if it's um, to do with safety or, or, or how they interpret something, pull over to the side of the road and let them explain to you what they're trying to say. Don't, don't just shoot them down, don't just think that they're trying to tell you what to do. I've had trainees who are better drivers than some of the instructors I've worked with. I'm telling you that now for a fact. Some of the trainees, I've, I've, I've taught a guy who actually scored zero on his driving test. He was a brilliant driver. I've been fortunate to work with some brilliant bus drivers who could have been successful racing drivers. I'm sure they had the skill set they could have transferred that into motor racing. And um, I've worked with some appalling driving instructors whose driving standards weren't that great. So don't assume that just because you're the instructor and they're the trainee that they have to listen to you. Sometimes you need to listen to them and they might teach you something. Um, when I was a driver, I started just after privatization, privatization in 1995 and um, because at that time there was a lot of um, emphasis put on completing your mileage and not being turned if you were running late, the controllers were very reluctant to turn us so we were under a lot of pressure to make up time. Now, I'm not going to incriminate myself by saying anything here, but you can work it out for yourself. 18-year-old um, who just left school, put in charge of a double-decker bus, um, dealing with uh, controllers who never really wanted to turn the drivers when they were running late. Well, we were under enormous pressure and we had to make the difference. Um, and there isn't that much pressure now, actually, on the drivers, I think. With iBus now, um, things are a bit different. But in other industries, for example, truck driving, coach driving or even delivery vans um, I'm sure that they are still under a lot of commercial pressure to get there on time um, but I likened it to a bit of a war zone out there because I've had people you know get on the bus with knives fighting I've had people get on the bus with chains fighting um, I've had all sorts of situations where people have taken a shot at the bus with an air pistol um, thrown a brick at the bus and cracked a window so you need to be acutely aware when you're out there that it's a little bit of a war zone and um, you've got to really be thinking about the perimeter of the bus all the time, what's, around, what's in your perimeter, you know, and, and make your perimeter as big as possible so you know if you've got a group of, you know, kids standing up by the side of the road that they might lob something at the bus. If it's snowing, be prepared for people to throw snowballs at the bus. Um, if you're driving through an area where there's lots of school kids, it might be a good idea to keep the cab window shut because they might decide to egg you. Um, all those things can happen. I've had people push empty shopping trolleys out in front of my bus when I was driving. I've had people push an empty baby buggy out in front of the bus, which was quite alarming, and I had to stop and obviously got out and had a look, and the buggy was empty, there was no baby in it. But that's what they do at night time for fun. Um, so there's all these pressures that the drivers don't see, and you've got to explain it to them. Um, the biggest one is really when they're running early, because a lot of people think that the job has come, become stressful when you're running late. Well, when you're running late, you just drive. You don't have to worry about anything. The problem is when you're running early, for example, during COVID, where the buses were gaining 20 minutes on the routes because there was no traffic there. And they can't all arrive at the bus stand early because there's nowhere for them to park. So you're having to stop at each bus stop for two or three minutes and explain to the customers, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to wait here for a couple of minutes because we can't, you know, be early. And the passengers get really annoyed because um, they can't see why the bus is stopping when there's no traffic on the road. And they don't understand that buses can't run early, they have to run according to their schedule, otherwise it creates uneven gaps in the service. So you need to explain that to the trainees and tell them how that's something they're going to come up against and how to deal with it. The biggest, um, I think, secret of doing this, doing this job well is being able to communicate clearly with the passengers and they need to have the confidence and capability to make announcements and tell the passengers what's going on and use their common sense, you know, if it's winter and you're spending two or three minutes at a bus stop, then keep the doors open. And if it's summer, don't keep the doors shut. You know, it's basic, but you'd be surprised how many bus drivers do it. They, they'll sit at the bus stop, not thinking about the passengers if it's too hot, too cold. Um, and, and from my experience, the biggest um, uh, problem out there is drivers who aren't communicating clearly with the passengers. Um, they need to have the confidence 
to do that and keep the passengers informed so that passengers don't get angry because there's a lack of information. They don't know what's happening when they're just sitting there waiting for the driver to drive. So there's that too. Um, I told, about, told you about my peripheral knowledge. Well, I, I cycle, I'm a keen cyclist, I ride motorbikes. Not recently, but I have ridden motorbikes and owned motorbikes in the past. Um, I've done 35 hours towards my private pilot's license. I've got a keen interest in engineering, um, motor racing. Um, I did a year of Formula V single-seater racing when I was 24. Um, and I wish I'd kept that up, but unfortunately I never had the money to do that. I'd run out of money. Um, and um, it's important to use your peripheral knowledge in this job as well, because it's really important that you inspire the trainees. Um, it's easy to tell people an individual fault. But what you need to be able to do is tell them, um, give them the general feel of the drive. You know, tell them, look, this might be your individual fault. You might be a bit heavy with the brakes. You might be a bit fast. You might be a bit slow. But the overall feel of the drive has to be right. You know, the examiner needs to feel that the drive is right. Um, if their speed's good, but they tend to stamp the brake pedal because they're not coming off the gas early enough and giving the engine and retarder time to uh, slow the vehicle down. The engine braking first, and then obviously use the retarder before you actually use the brakes, um, it's going to make the driving very abrupt and lumpy. So although they might be not driving too fast, the driving is very lumpy, the feel is wrong. Um, so you need to understand that. Um, it could be that their steering is good, but their steering is very erratic, so there needs to be smooth. Um, it could be that they're um, not looking far enough down the road. I mean, they're doing everything correctly, they're getting away with the drive, but you can see that they're just not dealing with things far enough down the road. And it's really important at this stage to talk about what makes a good driver. If you ask most people what makes a good driver, they might say a smooth driver, they might say a fast driver, they might say um, a relaxed driver. Well, you can be good at any one of those things, but I'll tell you now what makes a really good driver. First of all, it's the ability to see a number of different problems at the same time. So if you're driving down a busy road, you can see in the near field, the car door opening, you can see the person stepping onto the zebra crossing. But in the midfield, you can also see the traffic lights have been green for a long time, they may change. And in the far field, you can see that police car coming towards you with the blue lights and the siren on. You might not be able to hear them yet. You, your sense of hearing is very important when you're driving to hear what's going on around you as well, because the, the image of what's going on around you is created in the brain. The eyes and the ears just send the information in and the brain creates the image of the world around you. So hearing is really important, but you might not be able to hear that police car, but your Peripheral vision should pick up on the blue strobe lights and you should see in the far field while you're dealing with the near field and the midfield. So it's the ability to deal with multiple problems at the same time, not do what some drivers do, which is just look at one thing at a time. Because when we talk about the driving line now, that's the position you need to take, the average position you need to take to be able to deal with everything on the road correctly, not going too wide, not going too far in, not surrendering your position, not being a bully. That average position you need, what we call the driving line, which is in my other videos, um, that will only happen if you're looking far enough down the road and blending all the situations from one to the other um, and regulating your speed. So as you're blending your position and speed, it's giving you the correct speed to deal with each situation. So, for example, if you're coming up to a car door, you might have to come off the gas and move out a little bit, signal and move out. But then you stay off the gas because you've got a zebra crossing in front of you. Um, and you don't touch the gas on the approach to the zebra crossing, then as you get through the zebra crossing, you might need to use a little bit of gas to get up to the next traffic light, which is still green, but as you get to the traffic light, you come off the gas. So you're regulating the speed smoothly and doing the majority of the work on the gas pedal. We, we try not to use the brakes, we use the gas pedal to slow the vehicle down most of the time. But while you're doing that, you're blending your position as well. So it's the ability to see multiple things at the same time and, and deal with them. And it's also the ability to do that smoothly and predict what you cannot see. So while you're dealing with what you can see and blending your position and speed, you're thinking about also what you cannot see. And that's where, you know, you we teach you that you need to be able to learn to see with your brain, not just your eyes. So um, a good example of that is when, when pilots are flying, you know, they, they if they're flying a long haul flight, um, as they're going along, they're thinking to themselves, right, if we get a technical fault here, if we get an engine failure, if we get a fault, where are we going to now? So they always know the moment something happens where the closest diversion airport is, they don't have to start thinking where is our nearest diversion airport. The moment a problem happens, they've got it locked and loaded already. They know where to divert to. So there's just a matter of following the processes, doing the checklists and making sure everything's happening as it should. But you always have your nearest diversion in your mind. 
And the same way when you're driving, you've always got to think about things well ahead and have it locked and loaded so you know what's going to happen, especially when you're instructing. Um, and yeah, so what do we talk about? The psychological aspect, um, the attitude, technical aspects of the bus breakdowns, and then the actual drive itself. And yeah, so at the moment I'm on holiday in Portugal. Um, it's past midnight now and there's nothing to do. That's why I'm making this video. But it just goes to show you how dedicated I am to my job because I'm on holiday. Um, and I'm doing this to share with you, um, to give, try and give you an insight into the job. I'm gonna do another video actually, um, because I wanna explain, uh, this is more gonna be more for the trainees, but the instructors will benefit from, from this as well, um, how to position yourself, um, especially when overtaking, how to move out safely on dual carriageways, because a lot of trainees forget the length of the vehicle. So when they look in the mirror, they see a vehicle behind them, but they don't realize that the vehicle isn't behind the back of the bus because the bus is so long. And they'll tend to signal it and move out too early and the back of the bus affects the following vehicle. So I need to do a video for all the trainees so that they appreciate how long the vehicle is and they realize that they've got to move out when they've got a safe gap from the back of the bus to the car, not from where they are to the car. Um, the other thing I need to do is a little bit more work on, on roundabouts and um, um, do another video on um, What's the other thing I wanted to do? Roundabouts, dual carriageways, and left and right turns. Um, I've got some videos on YouTube at the moment which you can watch and hopefully you have watched already and you've learned from that, but I'll add to that as time goes along. But as I say, um, um, it's past midnight now, so I'm gonna say goodnight and bye-bye from Portugal.